The road to space isn't paved with technology and rockets alone. It's built on the dreams, risk, and relentless spirit of those who dare look up and say, we belong there. For over 30 years, the Space Frontier Foundation has been a home for these visionary, radical, action-oriented individuals. Hear their stories, learn how space was shaped, and revel in the revolution of commercial space pioneers. Today, I get to have a conversation with Jim Muncy. You may have heard his name, maybe here in the other episodes in this Commercial Space Pioneer series. Uh, you may have heard his name sometimes mentioned with a growl, uh, sometimes mentioned mm -hmm. with praise. Uh, but as one of uh, the, our three co-founders of the Space Frontier Foundation, Jim has been very active in creating a world that every space company today has been affected by. Uh, and Jim, thanks for taking the time to talk to us and walk us through at least some of the stuff uh, about your, your exploits uh, and the work that you have done. So how would you best describe kind of the role the the space that you occupy in the space industry where where would you put yourself well, that's probably in? changed from time to time okay i was actually thinking about that sort of that question last night as i stared down the barrel of of coming on the show today first of all one way of looking at me is i'm someone who has straddled the inside game and the outside game in okay. other words i've 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 spent what was it I guess about seven years working on Capitol Hill and a couple of years plus um, working in the Reagan White House um, as a junior troublemaker. From time to time, I've entertained the idea of going back into the executive branch, but never really, never really um, uh, pursued it. I've always been sort of right outside the door and often in the room when things are getting done. Um, and, as and, a representative of industry in the in the Space Frontier Foundation and, and to some extent more generally in the movement, we talk about there being an inside game, which is, and, and it can have a pejorative aspect to it in the sense that, you know, sometimes people who are part of the policy process in Washington, D.C. look down on people that are activists out in the out in sure. the broader country and 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 those activists are in, in, engaged in what's typically called the outside game so you know there's the goal of of influencing what what's covered in the media of what arguments and debates happen on television or on the web or or on um, social networks but then there's the the testimony and questions that are asked at hearings, and there's the drafting of the legislation behind closed doors, and there's the development of, of regulations by a federal agency and, and, and policy and programmatic decisions made inside the executive branch. And all of that stuff is the inside game. There's a relationship between the two, okay? You know, there's a famous... Uh, aphorism in Washington that it's called the Washington Post test. If there were an article on the cover of the Washington Post tomorrow about what you're doing or about the decision you're about to make or about mm. the program you're starting or about something you're doing as a policymaker, would it look good or would it look bad? You know, would it be... Would, would there be quotes from people attacking it or would there be quotes from people defending it? You know, how would it, how would it come out? It's not just uh, about avoiding a story about corruption. It could be avoiding a story that just, you know, politically smells bad or doesn't reflect yeah. credit on elected officials or important people whose favor you, you, you need as someone inside the bureaucracy, as someone inside the policy machine. 
it's not just the executive branch that oh, yeah. goes to the hill too so so the so the idea is if the outside game can create what might be called a, an echo effect a, a useful reinforcing culture uh or conversation about uh, a, a point of view on space or some issue relating to space then the coverage of the inside game may hopefully reflect that that alignment and the important point in, in your explaining this is it's not ever just one thing or no. to be successful no, it's, it's, bob werb and i spent way too much time in the 90s and, and and early aughts talking about how to organize things and how to how to how to try to figure out you know and, and organize the work we we saw for the foundation and there's no perfect way to do it there is no right way there's uh, just whatever there's just whatever gets as much work much of the work done or gets you some victories that you want to achieve, or at least gives you the possibility of those victories, whether they're tactical or strategic. Ultimately, there's what you do yeah, and what you get done, you know, how you got there and the, you know, the specific trail of breadcrumbs that you, that you scattered or, or spilled on the way there um, might look totally crazy after the fact. And, and I mean, that's certainly true of me personally. I mean, people. It's, it's true by and large. Uh, a lot of people like to rearrange the facts to tell a good yarn afterwards. But one of the really important things is not trying to figure out an optimal solution because there right. is no such thing as a. No, good enough. Good. You, you don't have yeah. time. You yeah. just don't have the time or and. And you don't have the extra resources to to throw at. I mean, I would much rather spend time or resources understanding the motivations of my enemy or my adversary or just some way I can influence pe the way certain people think about something than, if, uh, than I, I do on how we organize it and who's on the committee and who's not on the committee and yeah. all that nonsense. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to pull to a slightly higher level and I'll tell you my interpretation of you and okay. you help correct in the world of all of the activities around space. Jim is the person who knows how to operate the systems of government and of politics both, and is a skilled practitioner in those understanding how do things move and also you are a deep, you have deeply held beliefs about the space domain. So you have kind of like the philosopher and the politician combined. Yeah, that's fine. And, and, and I, the, only, <laughs> the, only, the only, um, only quibble if any of that is I wouldn't necessarily say that I have the expertise in actually running the government system but in working with the government working. system, I sure. understand. They are different. I think yeah. I understand the motivations and the goals of the people in government because I've been there. Yeah. But but I don't try to tell them, well, I was a muckety muck, therefore you should listen to me. I I'd rather say, tell me if I'm right when I say that that you are you care about X, Y, and Z. Right. And you're trying to achieve A, B, and C. And given that, here's what my advice would be. Right. Okay. And that hopefully that'll be resonant with them because I'm talking about their language. And I'm talking in terms of things they care about. Yep. And I'm not just coming and saying, oh, I represent Elon Musk or I represent CSF or I represent whoever I've represented over the past 20 years you know, you should give us what we want. Okay. I mean, there are a lot of people who do that very, very well. I'm not one of those people. I've never been good at advocating for something I didn't believe in. Mm. Um, in that sense, I am, I am, I am Eric Hoffer's true believer. I, I believe that and have always believed that an open frontier in space is essential to the survival of human civilization. That what makes human civilization great 
freedom, creativity, opportunity, the natural, you know, the normal market mechanisms that allow for people to create prosperity and, and, and advance forward, all those things which we tend to call Western capitalism or Western civilization, whatever, all of those things require a growing, advancing, organic, uh, frothy, bubbling civilization. And that doesn't happen in a closed container. Uh, it requires openness and ex an expansive context and understanding that, oh, there's all this energy right above the atmosphere. Oh, there's all the, these raw materials right above the atmosphere. We're not limited to what's on the planet. That's not saying we can throw the planet away. No. It's just say, understand that Both the planet, you know, yeah. the planet and its environs are our home, not just the surface of the planet. All right, so that is the gym today and what you believe. Now what I want to do is I want to dial back the clock and figure out what led to that set of beliefs. And so your one of your co-founders, Reverend Rick Tumlinson, talks an awful lot about the Apollo era and how it, it shaped the generation. Take me back to a younger Jim Muncie. Do you have any recollection of what space was when you were a kid? Like, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, my father was uh, an electronics engineer working for the FAA. And oh, back in the right. 1960s, uh, one of the NASA headquarters buildings was right next to the FAA headquarters building. The FAA headquarters building is still in the same place, and, uh, and NASA's moved several times since then. Been bigger than the sixties, right? Uh, uh, right. Um, yeah. <laughs> but 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 the FAA has stayed in, stayed in the same place. Anyways, he would typically go in to work on the weekends to get a little extra work done um, when the phone wasn't ringing and stuff like that. And he would take me in with him, and he would drop me across the street at NASA. And this was Apollo. Yeah. Well, first of all, this is before it's, all yeah. this security and things, not just 9-11, but just, you know, all the security rules, you know, going back into the, I guess, into the 70s. But much more importantly, it was Apollo and people were working on Saturday. There were a lot of people working on Saturday and the library at NASA headquarters was open yep. on Saturdays because there were too many people working in the building who needed the support of the library to be open. Space wasn't a nine to five, 40 hour a week job. It was, we're going to the moon in a decade and we're all working our asses off to try to make this thing happen. Okay, even at headquarters, not just the, the R&D centers, but you know, even at headquarters, I would go over to, I would get dropped off and to go into the library at NASA. And I was like, seven or eight years old, they would send me home with maps of the moon from the early surveyor missions. And they would send me home with brochures and they would send me home. Um, and I would read books there. Uh, and I would read, you know, pamphlets that they put out and stuff like that. I wasn't into science fiction yet at all, really. Yeah. But how I old are you roughly? I mean, this is again, eight, seven, eight, nine. Okay. You know, I was 11, well, I was just over 10 when we, uh, almost 11 when we landed on the moon. Okay. The humorous joke that a lot of people have made, um, Gary Olson is one who coined this, is I was born two days after NASA was created. NASA was established mm -hmm. officially on October 1st of 1958, and I was born on October 3rd of 1958. First anniversary of Sputnik was the next day. So I was born in the last day of the first year of the space age, okay? And I was born two days after NASA. And of course, Gary opined at a party unknown decades ago that of course I've been dogging their heels ever since, okay? And and, and I do have that sort of love-hate relationship with our space agency. But, but they but got a two-day head start on. At the time, it seemed like NASA was doing all this magical stuff and it was wonderful and I, and I thought it was cool. I didn't stay involved in it or studying it, really. I didn't read a lot about it in my, like, in my teens. 
but I had this sense of connection to it from my youth. Okay. Other other thing I remember from my youth was my parents were um, generous enough uh, and successful enough as you know rising middle class American professionals that they took us on trips to Europe. And I very much remember a trip to Europe in the 60s where Pan American gave out coloring books to the kids. And the coloring books were of Pan American spaceships, Pan American space stations, Pan American bases on the moon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this was very much in uh, probably connected to their PR offensive to you know, offer trips to the moon, and and I think there's you know famous uh, you the know movie. membership cards in the Moon Club yeah. or something they called yeah. it for trips to the moon, and and the important thing about it was was that Pan American, their identity as a company, their whole concept was that they if you were going to a a faraway place or an exotic place or an adventurous place from the continental United States, you were going to go on Pan America because they went everywhere. Of course, they were going to be the company that took you to the moon. Yeah. That took you yeah. into space. Was, um, so featured in 2001, A Space Odyssey. So that's 68. Absolutely. Right? It, Absolutely. It was all part of that. Was, was your experience before the movie like before yeah. like okay yeah so, my experience with a coloring book was even before that and it and like, it, it was like the trip was 60 pan am trip was 66 all right we so did. it was not just a passing thing no and, no it was going on for a few years that they were they were out there identifying themselves as the company that was going to do that because it was a, an extension, it was just a different location of if you're going to travel. Right. Also interesting, I think, as we're discussing this, there, since Pan Am went away in early 90s, right. there might be people that see 2001 A Space Odyssey today and think Pan Am is just a made-up company. Right. But it wasn't. And by the way, I had to double check. The reason your dad didn't just drop you off at the Air and Space Museum is because it wasn't there. It wasn't there, right? <laughs> um, there, 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 the 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 air there were um, <laughs> not museum quality yet. It hadn't happened throughout, throughout the 1960s. There were still Quonset building, Quonset hut, and other large temporary structures that had been put in place during World War II. Yeah, along the mall. Where it's, there are now museums, it's okay, but they were, they were temporary of, structures then, yeah. and there were was a temporary structure um, over near what's called the Smithsonian Castle. That is the yeah. old red, very old red yeah. brick that was the he headquarters of uh, of the Smithsonian, and back in the eighteen hundred, late eighteen hundreds, and that there was a. There was an air and space sort of department, or you know, there were there were there were collections of air some airplanes there. There was the Silver Hill facility uh, out in Maryland where lots of airplanes were stored. But it wasn't until '76 when they opened the Air and Space Museum, and Michael Collins was the first director of it that there was an actual space museum, a aviation and space museum. I mean, there were things that it were in the arts and industries building and other, other older buildings. It was all pulled together as an air and space collection when the first museum was set up. And then of course, 20 years later, Stephen Advarhazy gave, um, you know, billions of dollars to Sony and they created the, the, the center out at Dulles where there's a space shuttle now and et cetera, et cetera. So, all right. So, 10 year old goes to Europe, gets some exposure to other cultures. Uh, your dad's working at the F8. And I just, out of curiosity, your dad, how did you, how did you view your dad's job? Like, was he management? Was he engineering? What was his, his role? He was and a how senior did engineer, um, okay. but he was a, a really, really smart engineer. Okay. He, he ran the development of the onboard weather radar that flew on the 747 when it came out. 
Okay. And was supposed to fly on the SST. A large part of what he did, he was he had worked in radar since literally since during World War II. It was interesting to learn that that what he did inside the FAA was always trying to get pilots more information about okay. what was going on in, in the weather and environment around them. So you weren't just providing the information to people on to controllers on the ground. You weren't just fitting within the FAA's paradigm of everything is controlled by people on the ground, not by the people in the air. The people in the air are just smart rats that, you know, flip switches at, you know, um, not, <laughs> a, not, a, not unlike the early model of what astronauts were. OK, yeah. one of the last things he worked on before he retired was apparently at in the 80s, the FAA had a. A, 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 a network of radio beacons that put out a certain amount of weather information in digital form all over the country. And my father worked with MITRE and some people in, in industry to create a standard receiver and thermal printer. I mean, think about this as like, you know, the days of calculators and initial thermal printers and calculators and small computers. Any pilot, OK, for like a thousand dollars or less. And they weren't thinking in terms of CRT screens then because they were really expensive at the time. Right. They could literally sort of push a button and then they would have a weather map of their surroundings wherever they were. The idea was always to get the weather information to the pilots. And there was a time in high school where I understood how to read National Weather Service maps. Um, because he taught me and then I, that, that fell away. But you know, my dad was always trying to teach me practical, useful stuff. As dads often do. I, I wish I had absorbed more than 10% of because it would have solved a lot of things about my life. Jim, that's. But he was that's smart. He then knew how to put engines together. And of course, electronics and everything. Yeah. I mean, he did. Tale of all his time. Fathers always want to pass on their hard-earned knowledge and sons are busy running off doing something different. But out of that, you were so you had you grew up around aerospace as you know, you know, broadly in the if you combine aero and space, and they don't always fit together, but so you, you grew up with it and you grew up in the DC area. But the other the other thing I learned was that people I learned at a fairly early, early level that that you could have the right technical solution, but if people weren't supporting it politically, it didn't matter. How did you, you know, know that? In other words, my father would have a project, and 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 I alluded to some of his issues. I'm absolutely convinced that some of his problems had to do with the FAA not being very good about innovating. And not very being very good about adopting new technologies and rushing new technologies into place so that you could actually empower the pilot okay. with more information and stuff like that. And early in my career, professional career, I found that the FAA was horrible about that. And just as my father was retiring, I was learning, you know, back in the 1980s, Gerard O'Neill offered the FAA for free the patents for what was called Geostar, which was a geosynchronous based positioning and navigation system and comm system, also for short messages. And he offered it to them for free. And he had developed it because of a ground crash in, in San Diego in 1978. He said, there's no reason why everyone shouldn't know where everyone else is. So, and, so they obviously said, thank you, and we will pay you money. Oh, because yeah, because what they wanted to do is build the next generation of non-space-based stuff, which so they, they said would take two decades. And then they will go look at doing a space-based system after that, okay? Well, it's now at that time, and we still don't have a space-based system. We have, they're using GPS and other things that are, it's not space-based yeah. fundamentally in its architecture. It's still based on radars and other things yeah. like that, ground-based radars and things like that. And that's just insane. Yes. Um, so, but hold on, you didn't get fed up with this insanity 
and say, screw this, I'm going to go someplace that makes more sense. No, no. What I was seeing in NASA in terms of NASA not being willing to do things that were obvious and smart, okay, was a pattern in government. It wasn't just NASA. It was the FAA was the same way or if not, if not worse. So we've gotten kid. um, Space was a thing you were aware of, but wasn't it hadn't become like, was there any point? through high school where you were like, hey, maybe I'll have a career doing space stuff? Was it similar to sports in that it was a thing that was in the news and people talked about it was really cool, but wasn't? No, no, no. In in, um, in 77 or my first year at the University of Virginia, I took a seminar where I got to learn about and I read parts of High Frontier from O'Neill and, and some other NASA summer study reports So I was learning about the idea of space colonization and things like that. And then I came back five years later, my very last semester, and wrote some papers for different classes I was was taking relating to space colonization and space industrialization. What I actually studied at UVA was math and computer, and mostly computer science and math. But by the time I finally got to my last year at UVA, I was a lot more interested in the policy and political and management issues around computers and and technology than I was the actual programming and 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 com- actual computer science part of it. Um, why is that? Why do you do you recall why? My fourth year, I was on the five year plus plan. My fourth year, I taught a liberal arts seminar called Computers for the Layman. Up until that point, the only thing available to uh, liberal arts students at the university were the introductory programming classes that the computer science uh, department taught. And that were sort of like generic introductions to computers. They had people go type up punch cards and and run Fortran programs. It was a a skill class. It was a skill class, not a understanding assessment. And, and, And what I did was I said... I don't know what you're going to do with your life. I don't know what your field is going to be. But by the end of this class, you're going to have done something as your independent project that actually shows the use of computers or how they will be relevant to whatever field you're studying. Someone wrote a computer art thing, paper. Someone did a Star Trek game. Someone did something about computers and business. I mean, and it was all very, okay, I was dealing with, it wasn't just that I had thought that this was important, that that I thought that people were going to need to know how to use computers no matter what. This is in 1979. You're just starting to see personal computers come out. Yeah. And I would have, I was actually had been on the university's compute administrative committee for computers. Okay. So I was one of the student members who was giving these big shot computer center managers and other people my unvarnished, you know, stupid kid opinion about things. And, you know, and there were people like astronomy professors who just wanted the university computers to be able to do really fast batch processing of large amounts of data of their scientific results from telescopes. And then there were people like me who was advocating for more time sharing systems and more, more things that put terminals accessible to pe- to students so they would get a sense of actually working with the computer and 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 something like they might use in in the real world anyways my point is is that it was these issues of what should students be taught about computers should they be taught how to program or should they be taught how to use them i mean i taught them some about basic and i taught them a little bit about fortran and a little bit about pascal but I'm really dating myself here. It wasn't about teaching them programming. It was understanding the basic building blocks of a computer, the central processor, all the other pieces, and saying that these things are getting faster. They're getting cheaper. Um, although I certainly didn't didn't know what Moore's law was in in the late seventies, but I but I, I said you know, you're going to be using these, okay. Yeah. They're going to be tools that you're going to use in whatever you do, and you will probably keep using them 
or new versions of them throughout your career. So you better get comfortable with them and not think that learning how to program in Fortran is going to teach you what you're going to need to know about computers yourself. Because that's just going to teach you how to tell some programmer what you want the program to do, right. when what you really need to do is have a much more interactive understanding of, of, of them as tools and different different kinds of things they can do. Um, so how did that... Okay, so that makes perfect sense. Uh, and then I, I lobbied the university to create a new a new official course that did some some of what I was doing with my seminar, and so the fact that I got involved in lobbying for a course to be established. Uh, okay, there it is. And, and and as a as an activist within the university, okay, yeah. uh, and went through that experience, and I got a best paper award from the ACM for for the paper I wrote about AC, the class. ACM. The Association for Computing Machinery was the professional society of the computer scientists at the time. I think I know yeah. they're still out there. And and that was the thing where you're like, hey, maybe being yeah, on the there was something policy. about this policy side, something yeah. about the topic of computer literacy was get, coming up. There were more and more conferences about it. There were more and more discussions of it. The idea of that you needed to be literate, not necessarily a programmer, but you needed to be literate in how computers worked and what they were about. And so I said, well, this is fascinating. My last year was the 80 Reagan election, okay? I had voted for Jimmy Carter in 1976 as my first vote as a freshman. And I was very disappointed by Carter. I supported Reagan, but I also saw all these issues of opposition to nuclear power and other things going on, other technology issues that were becoming important national issues. I basically dropped out of my school my last year. Okay. I was in courses and I was supposed to be getting grades and I mostly got incompletes, but I was setting up a grassroots lobbying organization because no one told me I couldn't do that. That would be a pro-technology lobby. And I did it with some friends and had some advice from people. And that brought me to the attention of a young Georgia congressman who turned out to be Newt Gingrich. And I was brought onto his staff as a glorified intern with not much pay and trust really not much pay. Um, Wait, so you dropped out of college before... I was sort of dropped out. I mean, I was still there. I was still, you know, supposed to be enrolled. I was supposed to be taking them, but yeah. I was sort of dropping out in place. But while you did I was fascinated by all this, this, this policy stuff, and I got more and more into it, into the, into the policy and the, the whole idea of lobbying, and and I just didn't know I couldn't, so I did. All right, okay. I got to ask one other quick, quick question before we leave college behind. The university had a seminar course about space, but did not have a seminar course about computing. The, I find that the, the courses I took, I, I took like a, a course on soci, I don't know, sociology of the future or something. Okay. And I made it about space for me. Okay. I ah, tailored okay. it to this. Okay. <laughs> right. The University of Virginia is, you know, among other things, is but it's always been known for its political science and government programs okay. and its history programs. Okay. Because after all, it's Thomas Jefferson's university. Yep. So I didn't. I never took a history course the entire time I was at UVA. And the first government course I took was an 800 level, gut, uh, which of course they didn't let me t actually register for the 800 level graduate course. But, they, but it just so happened my very last semester at UVA, they taught a, a course on science and technology policy. Okay. And I took it and I attended it and I actually showed up for that class. And was fascinated by how we learned about, you know, how science policy and technology policy were developed, you know, who were the players, what was the role of Congress, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and some history of the science advisors and some other, other things that I learned. And this is all in calendar 80, I guess, spring of 81. So in case folks are not familiar with the layout of Virginia, DC is two hours 
if yeah, not more. Two, it's 120 from miles from, from Charlottesville, right. Yeah. So are you – Are you? But I was from D.C. I was from Arlington. I lived in right. Arlington with my parents, and I and I went and I just – and I traveled to UVA because I got a, Ooh, um, into a right. special program when I applied there, which I was probably the worst possible person to get into this program because they let me study anything I want with no area requirements or anything. <laughs> boy, I really needed structure, and they yeah. didn't have any for me. I was – I was told I could study anything I want, whatever. And let's just say I had to attend summer school three years <laughs> running. Um, All right. Okay. So I, and I find this you know, fascinating because, again, we've never talked about this. Those themes continue to show up, I know, through your history and then in popular, like, it's still a thing today. So uh, for the first 10 years or 15 years or maybe 20 years of my career, people, when I would go give speeches like at L5 conferences or NSS conferences or uh, other, other, other meetings, people would come up to me and say, I want to do what you do. In mm. other words, I want to work on space policy. I want to, <laughs> I want to make a difference, et cetera, et cetera. How did you do it? How did you get this? How did you create this for yourself? I said, don't do it the way I did it. Okay. Yep. Because if I had known that I was going to be working in space policy, I wouldn't have taken all those computer science and math classes. I would have taken government and history and economic, more economic classes. I would have learned much more about the actual meat and potatoes of policy and politics and been prepared. Okay. But, but you would not have then run that course. No, I wouldn't have run the course and I wouldn't have done, you know, done the, the things I did. Right. See, like, right. I, I was, I mean, you can't get there. You can't get there. Like it just, right. no, no, no. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in any way saying I did it the wrong way. It's just it wasn't no. a model that you could replicate because it, no. it was just weird. And and I would just happen to be in the right place at the right time. You know, I worked for Newt for two years. Um, I helped him write some crazy legislation. Who I helped him Newt? sell the congressional space in eighty. So was he when was he first elected? Was that his he first was elected in seventy eight? Seventy eight, okay. So and he was a sophomore in eighty one. Yep. And in 81, his former chief of staff was very pro-space. Uh, um, and some other friends, Republican staffers, were pro-space. And they identified some Democrats who were interested. And they set up a congressional staff space group. Okay. okay. And I got to volunteer to help them and be part of their group, even though I wasn't a congressional staffer. I was just a, you know... A glorified intern. Okay. And you were there on a, you, you had started like a technology advocacy grassroots thing. Right. I did. Right. And that, and that was what I did the first year. Okay. And then Newt helped me set up a new foundation called the Using Space for America Foundation. That was a nonprofit on space, focused on space. And, okay. and I did that for two years and we raised a little bit of money and kept, helped keep me alive. Um, and then he got me a job working for President Reagan's science advisor. And you need to understand, I did all of this stuff, you know, working, working for Newt, working for Jay Keyworth, and then working uh, at Geostar and, and at the Space Studies Institute through 1987. I hadn't finished my BA. <laughs> I didn't have a college degree yet. You did not have the... I didn't have the paper. I'd had five years of, of, of bruises and, and, and um, you know, uh, damaged ego, but um, I didn't have the paper. And I went back and took three courses at, at George Mason, which more than qualified to finish my degree. One was on the history of the frontier. Okay. Very useful course yeah. to have. One was on politics and gov government. And I got to learn more about, you know, how that stuff worked. But the point was I took those classes and I got my degree and I went to North Dakota in 88 in the second class of um, uh, students at the um, Center for Aerospace Sciences and the Space Studies program there at, at UND, 
when it was almost all, there was no there was no online version then there were captive students at the air force bases that needed to have some sort of professional education right. to help them as missileers become space officers and then there was um students on campus and i was one of the students on campus in the program the second very second year of the program i went up to study with david webb and literally after the first semester he gets himself fired and moves to another university and i'm left in the winter in grand fork stuck there not knowing what the fuck i was doing there and i stayed another year and a half and i finished my degree for someone that was like living at home commuting to college and working in dc that was a big shift Oh, yeah. I, I grew up in a metropolitan area. I was born in D.C. itself and lived the first almost two years of my life uh, right off of Connecticut Avenue in, in northwest D.C. So there were a whole bunch of other things you did in the 80s. But what while we're on, why? Why did you get like you went from, oh, I've been slow rolling my undergrad to I'm going to go to a graduate program. Why? Oh, oh, I, I, in 87, it became clear to me with the, uh, the merger with L5 and NSS was very um, challenging and, 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 and the decisions made in the first year um, of the merged organization were, uh, were pretty painful. I was depressed. I was upset. I, I had, you know, I had done a lot in those first five or six years, but I didn't feel like I was making a difference the way I wanted to. And I needed to take time off. David Webb told me and my friends told me saying, you're angry, you're nasty, you're depressed. You need to take some time off and go think about this. And, and so the thing to do, I realized was, let me go finish my degree and let me, um, and let me go, go off and study in North Dakota for two years, which is about as far away from DC as you can yeah. get culturally. Yeah. It was, it was, uh, it was interesting. It was different. It was, it was as much the physical experience of living in a very strange place, very different culture, and and of course, climate-wise, extreme. I mean, in D.C., we sometimes get you know, snowmageddon's or 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 you know, snow apocalypses or we call whatever. But it stays like that in Grand Forks for four or five months. It's whited over, which then reflects all the sunlight away, the little sunlight you're getting. And it's cold as all anything yeah. Yeah. for, you know, four months, for several months. And, you know, the people get snippy. And it was it was a really good experience because it, it, it the fact that I was locked up with my cat in my apartment reading, didn't have the internet yet, but it had a dial up way of getting to email. Okay. And just, I learned and I just read books and I had all my books with me. And so what, were you, uh, what were you like? Are you reading political philosophy or are you reading? No, no, nothing. To, no, I was reading books about space and um, and some some uh, te technology policy history and 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 then also f starting to really read science fiction. Right. Um, so I want to I want to and I know this is like you, you went there because of depression and anger. And so. I want to understand a little bit because more. I wanted to, I wanted to go get a credit. I wanted to think about okay. why had the first seven years of my career gone the way it had. Okay. So because I had to, I literally had to process it. I mean, I was thrown yeah. into this environment of Capitol Hill and, and then the white house and other things. But and I needed to think about how it had gone and why right. it had gone the way it had and you know why I was successful at some things and not good, not successful at other things, and and all of that. And of course, the other wrinkle was right before I left, we created the Space Frontier Foundation. Yes, which is I had never put those in time. I didn't know you spent time in North Dakota, but 
So as other people tell stories of meeting this young staffer who really speaks well and understands how space should be done and what the government, U.S. government should be doing, you're that young staffer. You have this interest in space. Um, and, and we've mentioned, you know, L5 Society uh, and National Space Institute that then forms into National Space Society. What, what you're also working with, um, you meet O'Neill at some point? Like, did you meet? Yeah, Which yeah I, met o, I met O'Neill when hmm. I was working for Newt. Okay. And, um, and um, at one of the L5 conferences, I think. Okay. And um, I had met several of his acolytes before then and knew about him. And, and, um, and so I, I, uh, and I had contributed money to the Space Studies Institute. And then later I ended up working for uh, Greg Miraniak at the, at SSI. Did you move uh, up there? Were you working SSI from no, I worked I worked at my, out of my house in Virginia, okay. but I often took the train up there and stayed a few days up there uh, okay. to work in the office up there. So you mentioned that you didn't have the, the degree. Right. Did you feel like that was getting in the way? Or like, it seems like you are right it, it in the was, middle. It, of the was, it, it, it was a minor annoyance. I mean, okay. you know, the fact that I didn't have the degree made it easier for people who were skeptical of my ideas to sort of reject mm -hmm. me out of hand. Okay. Um, sure. Not a good reason, and, but it but happens. And, okay. and, and ironically, uh, I won't tell you the story now, but in, in March of 1992, the only thing that shut people up, some people up that were fighting with me in the foundation was when I told them I had a degree. Hmm. I mean, literally, I, I mean, the arguments yeah. they were making were stupid. Okay. <sighs> And, Which are stupid, and, regardless of whether or not and, you have and a degree. The, and the and the and the basic principle response to them was easy, but what shut them up was what I had done, where I had worked, and the fact that I had a master's degree. That's what shut them up. Okay, so at least I didn't have to listen to their nonsense <laughs> for that reason. So talk to me a little bit here about the frustration that you were having through the 80s. So it seems like on one hand, you're right in a whole bunch of places and you have- yeah. and I'm, people... I'm making a huge difference, okay? Yeah. But at the same time, I'm not always quite getting all the way there in terms of realizing personally the benefit or, uh, uh, or, or the accomplishment. I mean, the reason why, I, I think Lori told you that industry gave the National Space Society, a bunch of money in the late 80s, okay? Yeah. That was in response to a lunch that Newt and I set up with the administrator of NASA, uh, Jim Beggs, and Hans Mark, the deputy Hans Mark in 1984. We went to them and proposed that they needed to do something to break out of the trap of not enough money for space and NASA and that they needed to do something creative. And we didn't talk numbers, but we talked about the idea of, of setting up a, 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 of the Using Space for America Foundation becoming a, a more aggressive, more politically astute, okay, than the nonprofits that already existed. And there was one uh, industry exec there who liked NSI because he had sort of a historic, he had employed uh, Von Braun when Von Braun set up NSI. And so he kind of thought that, you know, he was a fair child and he, and he sort of thought that they should still use NSI. But Norm Augustine said, no, you've got to start clean. You've got to do something new. Okay. And so he was endorsing me and my approach. And the McDonald Douglas guy was sort of like, wasn't sure, quite sure uh, what, what to do. And they, they had a meeting two weeks later and Norm Augustine wasn't on the call and another guy from McDonnell Douglas who absolutely supported NSI was on the call and they decided to give the money to NSI instead of me. 
right there. That was in 80, late 83, early 84. Okay. And I spent the next year to next year or two fighting with them. Why were they going to give money to an organization that had never done anything? I mean, L5 had at least fought the moon treaty. L5 was on the Hill with volunteer lobbyists yeah. supporting the space station program. NSI hadn't done anything. Okay. And, and that's not a criticism of Lori. Lori said no. herself, she was a no. glorified secretary at the beginning. Okay. And, and the point, and, and even Lori said, God, what these L5 are doing, they're passionate. They're, they, yep. they don't always know how to do what they're doing, but they're doing stuff. Okay. And, and so I just, I, you know, I was just, I was just frosted by this whole thing. I just couldn't believe that they were going to do that. But that was one of my disappointments. That was, you know, I had not been able to get them to see that they needed more, you know, something outside the nine dots of, of what they had done before. But I also learned that the reason they didn't want me is because I wasn't controllable. So they were never going to give me a million dollars to go set up a crazy organization. They, you know, they, they were, they wanted a lap dog. They wanted someone that was under their control and, and it was going away to North Dakota that taught me why things had gone that way mm. and, and, and learning and understanding, you know, the L5 NSI, NSI, merger and, and into NSS, um, while there was good potential and there were some good things that could come out of it, ultimately, that wasn't what was necessary. What was necessary was a very focused effort by some very smart people that weren't trying to build a mass movement, a mass membership organization, but wanted to focus on waging the war of ideas. And that was that was what the Space Frontier Foundation was. And, and we are going to pick up right there in the next part of this conversation. So now we have set up your journey from hanging out in the NASA library through college and then extended through college. And now, and, and some of, you know, your path into existing in this political world. Uh, and that's where I want to pick up the next okay. piece of this very next Great. episode.